morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to God's house this morning. I thank you for your presence as well as the consecration of your lives and your talents this morning. would call us to worship this morning and begin our time together with some words from the third chapter of Alma. And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have you spiritually been born of God? Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in this mortal body? And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, If you have experienced a change of heart, and if you have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? We will continue with the uh, order of worship, standing together and singing hymn number 512. And Brother Isaiah will bring our invocation after that. Lord our God, <clears throat> we bow our heads before you now in this your holy sanctuary. We take this time on your day to come together as one to worship you. It's my prayer that this hour we would be able to focus on you 
It's so easy for us to be drawn away, distracted, but I would pray that at this time, you would be the center of our minds, that we would be able to focus on you and let your spirit in. And I would pray that that spirit might flood over each one of us, fill us up and make us whole, that we might truly feel of your presence this hour, that we might be filled. And I would pray all of these things in the name of your Son, even Jesus Christ. Amen. I will be reading out of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, starting at verse 9. And then the people rejoice, for that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy, wherefore David blessed the Lord. Before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord. Lord God of Israel, our Father, Father forever and ever. You'll bow your heads with me. O oh Lord, we thank you, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for allowing us this chance to give back to you. For our Lord, we know that what you've given us isn't comparable. Lord, I pray that whatever we may give in return, we'll give it joyfully. And I pray that you will watch over those who decide how to use those offerings. I pray this in your most holy name. Amen. When I saw what the uh, theme was for today, increasing the pace of positive change, it made me think of uh, an excerpt from the last sermon that I gave at Bountiful, talking about um, the instruction we've had in Latter-day Revelation in regards to readying ourselves for <clears throat> excuse me, the insecurity and the troubles that were on the horizon for many years. and. That was sort of the whole idea of the sermon was going through the instruction that we've been given and um, how best we could implement that and what it means and why we've been given this forewarning and, and all of those things. And a certain part of the sermon revolved around talking about what we could do differently and what would affect um, the greater picture. And like that first hymn we sang, let there be peace on earth and let it begin 
with me, I think that it begins on a person-to-person -person level within us, and then that change will sort of spread out from that, from our contact with other people and from the way we're living our lives and connecting with the instructions and the words the Lord's given us. And it got me thinking, what do I do in my daily life that needs to be uh, changed or that needs to be sort of tilted on its head so I can see what I should be doing that I'm not. And I have, <clears throat> as, as we all have, I think, we, there's a lot of different people around us in the world that we interact with and that have very different opinions on varying topics, and especially uh, now with what's going on with the election and things like that. There are all sorts of views and opinions that are different from each other. And I think it's so easy to attribute malice to someone's viewpoint and to what they believe. And it makes it very easy to, for it to become an us versus them game. And that they must not, they must be broken in some way or they must want something bad if they believe in X, Y, or Z. And just switching that to understanding that they have a different point of view, but that doesn't mean that they are lost or that they mean less or that their worth is less than anyone else that we do agree with and that we do have these things in common with. Um, and not that we should necessarily move the goalposts of what's right or wrong or that it can change what we know to be truth and right, but just that there is some understanding and love in our hearts for those who we can disagree with on important things, not to devalue the things that we're disagreeing upon or that they might believe that we don't, but just they were always keeping important, keeping in mind the two most important commandments. And that's what I wanted to end with from Mark chapter 12, uh, starting at verse 33. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is hearken and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but him. And to love him with all thy heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. I don't want to alarm anybody, but I think there's a conspiracy afoot. Yes, you may not know it, but Will is behind me chuckling. Because when I looked at the bulletin as it uh, was delivered by the very faithful Jim Gates, I didn't look over to the right where it said Alma 3, 27 through 31, I just read the scripture, which of course is not Alma 3, as, as it's printed. So I chose Alma 3, verses 27 through 31 for my scripture. And then um, Eli covered a part of my sermon in his ironic moment. And then in class, uh, Eddie pretty much chopped my sermon right up. So for those of you who we're in class, I'm sorry. For those of you who, who didn't, it'll all be, be kind of new to you. But uh, here is, again, Alma chapter three, verses 27 through 31, as read by Kevin Falk 
instead of William George Lee Job. And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenances? Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Do ye exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in the mortal body? And because I liked it when I read it, and I can't say right off the top of my head where it comes from, someone probably could, I'm going to read what's actually printed as the call to worship. Behold, could ye suppose that ye could sit upon your thrones, and because of the exceeding goodness of God, ye could do nothing, and he would deliver you? Behold, if ye have supposed this, ye have supposed in vain. Do ye suppose that because so many of your brethren have been killed because of their wickedness? I say unto you, if you have supposed this, ye have supposed in vain. For I say unto you, there are many who have fallen by the sword. And behold, that it is to your condemnation. For the Lord suffereth the righteous to be slain, that his justice and judgment may, become, may come upon the wicked. Therefore... Ye need not suppose that the righteous are lost because they are slain, but behold, they do enter into the rest of the Lord their God. And now behold, I say unto you, I fear exceedingly that the judgment of God will come upon this people because of their exceeding slothfulness, yea, even the slothfulness of our government and their exceeding great neglect towards their brethren, yea, towards those who have been slain. For were it not for the wickedness which first commenced at our head, we would have withstood our enemies, that they could have gained no power over us, yea, had it not been for the war which broke out among ourselves.
even though I was cons uh, teasing a bit about the conspiracy here. <laughs> I don't think I feel the same about what's going on in our world today. Some of you may have known or noticed that I was supposed to speak last week, and I had a work thing, so Eddie graciously let me switch. Um, I'm kind of wishing I missed the opportunity to preach last Sunday, though, because it because of what happened on Tuesday. <laughs> it's like it's a completely new world and all, and um, I really haven't felt as much dread about what I think is going to happen uh, as I have before. I mean, I, I'll even say, and you know, I don't want to bring politics in this, but in the last election, I was afraid someone else would win. Um, and I felt to dread about that, but not to the degree that I feel dread about this. And um, to say that we've reached a new era in this country would be a, a plausible statement. Uh, new to this country, but not new in history of man. Many great nations have risen and, and fallen over the history of this world, and some as a result of their level of faithfulness to God and his command, and some simply as a result of their level of cruelty and appetite for sin. Some have succeeded in power because of God's favor. Others have succeeded in power because their enemies have fallen from God's favor. So I wanted to talk about how we recognize if we have lost God's favor, first as an individual. The first thing that I came up with was that we lose God's favor as an individual when we seek after things that are not of God. The second thing I came up with was that we lose God's favor as an individual when we lose focus on our true purpose. Or better said, when we want to become that which God has deemed sinful. The third thing I came up with is when we do not repent, we lose God's favor as an individual. The difference between those who have rebelled against God and those who have found God's favor is not that one has sinned and the other has not. We all have sinned. We have all fallen short. The difference is that one repented and the other did not. And the last thing I came up with is that we lose God's favor as an individual when we neglect God's presence. When we stop seeking the presence of God through prayer and fasting and study, through worship, we neglect one of the greatest gifts that we've been given. The gift of intercession, the gift that lets us approach the throne of God and commune with his Holy Spirit because of his own sacrifice. What a wonderful opportunity we have. We can engage with the, with the Creator through His own sacrifice. What a disgrace when we treat it so disrespectfully through our disregard of it. How do we lose God's favor as a nation? Pretty much the same reasons. We're just doing it at a national level via the laws we make and the representation we elect. I think it's safe to say that a large part of our nation's members, likely a majority, if you look at the popular vote counts, I can't do this. A large part of our nation's members have shown by the laws they support and their representatives that they have chosen, that they do not seek after the things of God. 
They do not, sorry, they do want to become that which God has deemed sinful. They are not repentant of those choices, and they do not respect or cherish God's presence. And the saddest thing about that is that these same people, or a large part of them anyway, will call themselves Christians. Seems we as a nation have a difference of opinion with God about what it means to follow Christ. You, many of you people, many of you people, many of us, how many of you know who Jeff Foxworthy is? Most of you? Okay, I'll just call it that. Thanks for the hands and the thumb. Uh, I love, you know, you might be a redneck if. So I'm going to read you some of, of my favorites. You might be a redneck if you ever, <clears throat> you ever cut your grass and found a car. You might be a redneck if you own a home that is mobile and five cars that aren't. You might be a redneck if your boat has not left the driveway in 15 years. You might be a redneck if chiggers are included on your list of top five hygiene concerns. Number one on mine. You might, you might be a redneck if you've ever raked leaves in your kitchen. You might be a redneck if you've ever, ever hit a deer with your car deliberately. You might be a redneck if you keep a can of Raid on the kitchen table, or if your wife can climb a tree faster than your cat. You hunters will get that one. You might be a redneck if your mother has ammo on her Christmas list. And those are funny and you know, Sadly true in many cases. But I wanted to read some others that I found that are called, You Might Be a Christian If. You might be a Christian if your home looks like a Hobby Lobby ad. You might be a Christian if you have at least one casserole dish or bowl you use for potlucks. You might be a Christian if you wistfully pictured a potluck after I read that comment. You might be a Christian if you accidentally said amen after reciting the Pledge of Allegiance one time. You might be a Christian if you were excited to learn that Chick-fil-A is adding macaroni and cheese to its menu. You wondered how many of those Chick-fil-A macs and cheeses you'll need to fill that potluck casserole. You might be a Christian if you actually pray when you see the prayer list. You might be a Christian if you feel increasingly out of touch with popular values. You might be a Christian if you are made to feel unkind, but you know you aren't. You might be a Christian if you vote your conscience rather than your opinions. And you might be a Christian if you just don't read scripture, you experience the words. I thought those were pretty good. Yes, it seems we as a nation have a difference of opinion with God about what it means to follow Christ. Those people who call themselves Christians. These same people and many others likely expect that they will be in heaven when they die. Whatever their understanding of heaven is, who knows. So it also would appear that we have different expectations than God. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Profession alone is worthless. 
1 John chapter 2 tells us that he who pretends to know God and yet disobeys his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. Faith in God must produce fruits. The fruits of obedience to God's law. And we know, because the Bible says it as well, that faith, if that faith has not works, it is dead, being alone. And also truth, and also truth, works unaccompanied by a sincere and living faith, also dead. So there seems to be a disconnect for us as a majority, as a nation, and individuals between our expectations and God's expectations. Just the other night, we watched a movie at the house called uh, Clouds. I don't know if you've seen it. It's kind of new out, but uh, it's a, based on a true story <clears throat> of a young <clears throat> high school student who had been battling a particular form of cancer, had gone through uh, chemo, I think, once, maybe twice, his name was, was it Zachary? Zachary, Zachary Sobiak. I think he was from Minnesota. Anyway, <clears throat> so the majority of his high school career had been one of chemotherapy, uh, no hair, you know, having to use crutches to get around. <clears throat> and he was well liked and of good spirits, it seems and had, a, had a, another recurrence about um, where he had to go in and, and had, they discovered he had a punctured lung. So he had to have a, you know, immediate surgery to go in and repair that punctured lung. And in doing so, they had discovered that the cancer had moved into the lungs. And basically, um, he was no longer considered uh, you know, possible treatment, he was terminal. At that point, there was just nothing that could be done. Um, and he, you know, was a, a pretty gifted guitar player, singer, you know, and liked to write songs with his best friend, uh, who happened to be a girl. And so upon finding out, you know, that he was now terminal and that he likely wouldn't make it to the senior prom, which would, I think this was a junior, maybe he was a junior when this happened, or I don't know. Anyway, he had to go through a lot of different pain and struggles as he realized what this you know, meant for him in a real world way. And you can imagine that he thought, well, what's it all, you know, what, what does it matter what I do? You know, kids his age were you know, writing college essays, kids his age were planning for the future. Well, when you know you don't have one, why bother doing anything? And so he had to search that out within himself. And he had always had a dream of being a songwriter. So he, he you know, kind of pulled himself up by his bootstraps and got his best friend. And they wrote a song. Or, no, I'm sorry, they didn't write it. They, well, they performed a song on YouTube. And then it got like, you know, 20,000 views. And then it got like 50,000 views. And then next thing you know, they were being contacted by a record label because they wanted them to, to do a, an album. And of course, you know, his story was, was one that was a, that drew some attention, you know. And even in that, you know, there were, there were people who would say things like, oh, you're not special, lots of people have cancer. You know, just the cruelty of, of the world we live in and, and things like that. But he ended up writing a song, and the song was called Clouds. And I'm not going to go through the lyrics of it, but it was basically a song of hope. And um, as a result, of him changing his priorities about what he was or should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, his life drastically improved for the time that he had left. And the lives of others around him who were impacted by what he did improved drastically because of his changes as an individual. And It's a bit of a tearjerker, so, you know, guys, Josh, don't, don't be afraid to let your feelings show when you watch it. 
But that got me thinking about what our priorities are as Christians. And just like Zach Sobiek realized that he had to take every day and do the best that he could with it, we have a responsibility to fulfill those two greatest commandments that my good brother Eli mentioned. We have to do that every day that we have, not just on Sunday, not just after we have provided for our own needs, or worse, after we have provided for our own wants, not even after we have provided for the needs of the church. Every day, first priority. The two greatest commandments, Eli, does either one of them mention any qualifying words like love the Lord your God on the Sabbath or love thy neighbor as thyself if he believes the same as you and if he goes to your church? Thank you. Every day, first priority. Now, don't get me wrong. Supporting the church, the body of Christ, is an important priority. But is it the highest priority? It seems to be a disconnect for us as a majority, as a nation, and as individuals between our priorities and God's priorities. But Kevin, we have to use wisdom, and we have to be able to eat and have shelter and pay taxes. Lots more taxes in the near future, I anticipate. We act as a nation, as a majority, and, an, and as individuals like we don't think God understands our predicament. Makes me think about the first photographs. I know none of you here are old enough to have experienced what the first photographs were like, right? But you look at them, you know, they're, they were black and white, or were they, I don't know, were the What's the tint where it's almost kind of brown? They call that something different. It wasn't black and white. It was tintype. Was that before black and white, or was that... I mean, because it almost feels like a really, really, really weak attempt at color. But anyway, so you had that, and then you had, you know, color photography. And then, you know, we had uh, high def, right? And then we had uh, 4K, and then, and then 3D. And, and I remember, you know, the stories about the primitive tribes or primitive peoples who believed that someone taking a picture of them was stealing their soul. And how, you know, how silly is that? How silly is that? They just really don't understand what's really happening here. Kind of like God's understanding versus our understanding. Can you imagine how many times God has looked at us and said, you really, you really just don't, that's silly. How can you even think that after everything? You know, no. But he still strives with us. He still is patient with us. He still tells us, no, you're not having your soul stolen. Your soul, soul stolen? You're not having your soul stolen when someone takes your picture. God does understand our predicament, and his expectations remain the same. The story of the rich, rich young Euler is one of my favorite. And it's not so much that it was uh, about being rich meant you were being bad. It was more about the rich ruler thinking that he didn't need Jesus. He had decided for himself that he had followed all the law and had deemed himself worthy what else do I lack? Well, you lack humility. For none is good except God, and none have not fallen short. And you lack love for God because you will not give up your riches in pursuit of the two greatest commandments. But worst of all for that rich young ruler, he knew better. Among the people who knew the law, you 
would expect that they would be classified as those who know better. God's priorities are God's. They're not ours to reprioritize. Is it more important to be first of something than to be worthy of something? You know, when a couple of elections ago and I didn't vote for the person who won, but there was a little bit of excitement in the idea of a first African-American president because I thought, well, maybe it's maybe something, maybe this change, maybe this, maybe there's something to what all this is about. Maybe he can step up and, um, and in my opinion, it wasn't, it wasn't so. Um, and I started to think about all the, uh, her, the hoopla and all of the, you know, excitement about the first of something. This is the first time we've had someone of this outward characteristic. Well, we could have done that and had someone maybe also be worthy. Is that, is that too much to ask for? Why does it have to be that an outward characteristic is more important than the worthiness? Uh, same thing with our new elect vice president. She's made history. She's the first of something, a couple of things, two or three things, actually, I think. But does that qualify her as being worthy? Do we, when we call ourselves Christians, assume that that qualifies us for something? We have to be worthy we have to have evidence in our lives every day. And if we're not doing something every day that addresses the two greatest commandments and also addresses our calling, our special calling as a church, then what can we expect? God wants us to be worthy, not first. Because the first will, shall be last anyway, right? Uh, like uh, Eli, the theme for today, we were just, uh, the, all of us were discussing it back there, except for Will, because he came late. But all of us were discussing back there, increase the pace of positive change. And it's a, familiar, it's a familiar call, but it's worded really cool. You know, increase the pace of positive change. Um, and then... Um, Josh, Josh started doing his imitations of Biden, and it kind of went downhill from that. But what does that mean to you? What does it mean to God? If you don't know with the assurity of the Spirit burning in your breast, then you wanna, might want to make a priority of searching that out. If you think you have different expectations than God, you might want to get that sorted. If you think your understanding is better than God's understanding, you might want to get some psycho psychiatric help. If you think your priorities just might not align by virtue of your fruits with God's priorities, please, please, please let us all get that sorted. You would turn in your hymnals to number 336. We will uh, stand together and sing this hymn uh, and uh, remain standing for the benediction.
Almighty God, our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we stand before you now, Lord, with hearts full and overflowing with the, uh, the joy and acknowledgement of your blessing in our lives, of the, uh, the gift of your only begotten Son, the sacrifice that was made for us and the price that was paid, which we never could. For the hand that reached out to us in the midst of our wayward path. To draw us back into your presence, to bring us back to the opportunity to to truly experience that love and that gift and that sacrifice and to truly give over our lives in response to it. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us, for your uh, incomprehensible act in saving us from our own desires, from our own sins, from our own path. And Lord, in this moment, in this day, and uh, in this uh, situation that surrounds us, where all is changing and all is often chaos. We look back upon with grateful hearts and with uh, an unspeakable joy to the anchor that uh, is in our souls, to the rock that we have to lean on and to stand on. our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we look to the opportunities before us to stand in the places that you call us, to be the people that you made us to be. Walk with us in that uh, effort, I pray, Lord. Lift each one up. May uh, each heart be pricked even now with your presence and your words and your guidance. And as we uh, leave this place and go back out into the world around us, light the path before us. Help us to see your desire and your will. Help us to see above all that we walk not alone, but uh, that you walk by our side. May we have the strength and the courage and the uh, dedication to stand in each and every moment as your children, as your sons and your daughters, and may we share in those moments the light and the love that you have given to us. These things I pray and ask as your benediction on this service and your blessing on each of us as we go forward, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.